everybody. Much better, thank you. And by the way, it's not you all that are just saying good morning also. We have a live audience today. We are live streaming right now on Facebook. All right? So, yes, so we're inv we invited in people from all over the world to be able to watch this conference as well. So we're expecting that. We're going to have thousands on there. You'll hear about it later in the week. If you also are on Facebook, we'll give the numbers out at that time. So I want to thank everybody at home, office, or wherever you might be watching this. Thank you for being here. Unfortunately, we can't take their questions at the end, though. We're only going to be taking questions from the audience that are here. So now, just so you all know that those that don't know, my name is Stuart Schlossman. I am president and founder of MS Views and News. I'm also a multiple sclerosis patient. I do what I do because there wasn't enough information out there when I was diagnosed. We could talk about that after the program if you have any questions for me. Today, we want to really, really, really give thanks to our sponsor, Ohio Health. I hope that you all can congratulate them and thank them. Awesome. And they are at the... They're in the back corner over there. I had, I had to stick them in the corner to make room for all of you to be here. We expected about 170, 175 people here today, and I really think we hit these numbers, so I want to thank you all for being here. Awesome. Thank you. We also want to thank our displays, everybody that was here to give, uh, to do the community resources today, as well as Genentech was here, so I want to thank them for being here as well. Okay, so today's program, very short and simple. Everybody's got a, an agenda on your tables. You're all sent to them, sent them constantly by email. By the way, who did not get an email? No hands up. That's great. I like that. So, yes, we send all those uh, announcements on purpose. You're here today, and you wouldn't, may not have been here because you may have forgotten about it. But you are here, and so I think I did a great job sending out all those announcements. Right? Great. Thank you. I like that. Thank you. All right. We are going to get started. Today's a very, very long program, all right? We have eight different people speaking, and I think our first one should be up around here shortly. She is there, all right? We have eight different people presenting, all right? Everybody's on a time limit, um, and at the end, after all eight presentations, we are then going to do a Q&A. So you have been given pens. I think that there might have been pads on the table. If they're not, please use the back of something. If you need paper, let us know. We'll try to get it for you. And other than that, we're going to have a great time, okay? So let's get started, and I'm going to first introduce Dr. Nicholas. All right. So Dr. Nicholas completed her bachelor's degree at Miami University of Ohio in microbiology. She completed medical school at the University of Toledo College of Medicine. She went on to complete medical internship and neurology residency, where she served as neurology chief resident at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and lastly, completed a fellowship in MS and spasticity at the Ohio State University Medical Center. During her fellowship in MS, she also completed a master's of public health in clinical translational science. So Dr. Boster, um, directs the MS Fellowship Program at Ohio Health and MS Outreach. Let's welcome again Dr. Nicholas. Long stride. So thank you. Thank you. Camera, I mean monitor and Okay, camera. great. Thank you. How are you all doing today? Good. Well, thanks so much for coming out. Uh, I'm really honored to be here to speak to all of you um, about a new uh, biomarker in MS. So how many people are tired of getting MRIs for disease monitoring? I should see way more hands than that. <laughs> So um, right now, we, we don't have something to clearly replace MRI, but I think the research that's been done in this new biomarker, something called neurofilament light chain, which we're going to abbreviate as NFL, um, not to be confused with the National Football League, which I would not be able to speak on for 25 minutes. Um, so this NFL is what we're gonna be focusing on today, and I think you'll find the research really exciting. So currently in multiple sclerosis, the best way that we can monitor the disease is seeing you in clinic, hearing about what's been happening over time, and 
examining you to see if there's been any change in your physical exam. In addition to that, your MS doc, uh, I'm sure, is bugging you uh, every so often to get an MRI. And the reason why is because we have trouble knowing if you're having new damage over time. So there's that silent damage that can occur in MS, and that you all may have experienced that even when you went in at the time of your first relapse and you had an MRI, you may have said, wait a minute, I only had one neurological symptom, but I have so many spots. Why didn't I have symptoms? Well, that's because our brains are so great at compensating for that, and especially when we're young, our brains are much bigger, and we have other pathways that, that our brain will uh, find to be able to do the same action. But the challenge is, is that MRIs are expensive. How expensive are your MRIs? Somebody tell me. Too expensive. I've had people tell me that with insurance, they've paid $2,000 for an MRI. That's, that's really outrageous, and I think we've got a lot to do to, to fix the healthcare system to have better coverage for testing that's so desperately needed. Absolutely. Um, but this, I think, is really exciting research that may help ultimately down the road to limit the number of MRIs that are needed. So what other biomarkers do we have in MS? Well, there's the dreaded spinal tap. I bet that's even less favorable than going in for an MRI. But I assure you, when we do it, it's very, very important. So the spinal tap is traditionally used in the diagnosis of MS. Luckily, the McDonald criteria that we use to diagnose MS does not require a spinal tap. So if it's very clear cut and somebody meets the criteria, they don't have to have a spinal tap, which is really good news. We really like doing them, but my patients tell me they don't like getting them. And I've had two before, so I understand. Um, but in terms of the spinal tap, uh, the spinal fluid, what we're looking for is something called oligoclonal bands. And I want you to say that five times fast. No. So that's a marker of inflammation within the central nervous system. And so we see an elevation of oligoclonal bands in the spinal fluid as compared to the blood in individuals that have multiple sclerosis. Well, interestingly, it's not specific because we can also see that in a number of other inflammatory conditions. But it can help us to hone in on a diagnosis and to support the diagnosis. So let's move forward and talk about um, the pathology of MS and the course of MS. And what I'm doing now is really setting the stage to tell you why this new uh, blood test that's being researched to monitor MS, uh, why that makes sense. So if you look at the, the slides on either side of the stage here, you can see these blue boxes down at the bottom. And I apologize if you can't read the words on them, but the top box says neuroinflammation, okay? And then the bottom box says neurodegeneration. And if you look at the x-axis, that's time, and the y-axis is really this pathology here. So early on, when somebody comes in with multiple sclerosis, their disease is very inflammatory. That's the time period where we often see more relapses. We often see that there are lots of new spots occurring on the brain. That's a sign of that inflammation in MS. But you can actually see on the bottom square that even when you come in at the time of MS, we're already seeing evidence of neurodegeneration, so shrinkage of the brain. Now, is there anybody under 20 in this room? Anybody under 20? Oh, uh, Dr. Bosser, put your hand down. <laughs> I said under 20. No, so. When you're 20 uh, and older, your brain is actually shrinking. So everybody in this room, whether you have MS or not, our brains are shrinking. And that's, that's natural. That's normal aging. But in multiple sclerosis, our brains shrink at a much faster rate if we're not on treatment to fight that inflammation. So you can see that early on, neurodegeneration is starting. And then as the course of the disease goes on over time, we see that there's more degeneration. But again, we're changing that. We have options to change it with treatment. So let's look and see what this NFL is all about. So what is neurofilament or NFL? Well, this is a basically a product that is released into the spinal fluid 
and even gets into the blood when there is damage to neurons. And what happens in multiple sclerosis? Well, our white blood cells, our own immune system, is attacking our neurons in the brain and the spinal cord. Now, if you look at the picture, you can see that there's a lot more of those neurofilament proteins in the spinal fluid, which is really that first column. But then you see in the blood that there's much fewer. So early on when this was being studied, they said, oh, we have this great new test. We can ask our patients if they'll let us do a spinal tap every couple months to monitor their disease. And when I asked my patients in clinic, 100% of them said, absolutely not or they just rolled their eyes and didn't even answer. So just kidding, we weren't really gonna do that with you guys. But that was done in research to, to validate. So there were some really nice, brave folks who had multiple sclerosis that participated in these research studies to see that. But fortunately, there are newer tests, and there's this assay called the SIMOA assay. It sounds kind of like a Girl Scout cookie. It makes me hungry. Um, but that test actually helps us to quantify the amount of this neurofilament in the blood. And so that's really neat, because I would far rather get a blood draw than a spinal tap. And I bet most of you would agree. If not, we've got a psychiatrist coming later. So the first step was to look at spinal fluid and blood and see does it correlate? Is it accurate if we look at this in the blood? And actually it does. So I don't want to bore you with statistics, but there's this, if there's any statisticians in the room, there's this fancy statistic that looks at that correlation. And the correlation was very, very tight. And it was highly statistically significant. So that's pretty cool. So that, that's proof that if you test it in the blood, that it is very accurate. Interestingly, when we looked at what was the most accurate for monitoring disease activity in MS, the CSF tended to be a little bit easier, the spinal fluid. Um, but again, I don't think that that is something that's going to be reasonable for monitoring people over time using spinal fluid. So don't zone out. I know it's early, and uh, Stuart put me first, and I've got all these weird slides with dots on them. But let's break it down. So if you look at the first picture, the one to your, uh, your left here, that's an image of testing in the blood. So that HC stands for healthy controls, so that means people who don't have MS. And then the one next to it says patients, so those are people with multiple sclerosis. You can see that the dots uh, above the patient column, that they're much higher up. And so what this showed was that if you test neurofilament, or NFL, in healthy individuals, the level is about 11 on average. But if you tested it in folks with multiple sclerosis, it was about 17 or higher. So that's pretty neat that we could see there was a definite difference there. The, the image uh, to your far right is actually the similar study looking in the spinal fluid. And again, you can see numbers much higher. So again, number in healthy controls was around 11. But if you looked at patients in their spinal fluid, that number was up in the 800s. So quite a difference there. So uh, CIS, so clinically isolated syndrome. Many of you may have heard of this when you originally came in to see your multiple sclerosis doctor, where they may have said, you don't meet the official criteria for multiple sclerosis yet, but you've had this first attack, and we're concerned that you could go on to develop MS. And they might have said, we recommend that you go on a treatment. And you said, wait a minute, but if I don't develop MS, how, you know, why would I go on this treatment? Well, there's a lot of uh, evaluations that we can use to determine and predict how much the risk is for somebody to go on to develop MS, because obviously we don't want to wait for somebody to have a second attack and to have more neurological problems. So how do we better make that prediction? Well, let's look at this NFL and see what the evidence is. If somebody comes in with their first attack, can it help us predict if they're going to go on to develop MS? So there was this study in the clinically isolated syndrome. So I put this here. So it was a, a large span of time, 2000 to 2015. And they actually looked at 222 patients who came in with the clinically isolated syndrome. And they were ages 15 to 55. And these were folks where they had spinal fluid and blood available from when they were in the hospital. And they based it on the diagnosis of CIS. 
So when we look at this slide, again, this makes you want to zone out first thing in the morning, but it's interesting and I've got fun graphics. The top picture basically tells you that the younger that you are when you come in, the higher your level of NFL. So if my patient looks like these guys, their level is going to be kind of low, but it's still higher than people who don't have multiple sclerosis. The next one down is actually talking about what if I draw that blood test the day that they come in for evaluation when they're having the new relapse versus waiting many, many, many days later. And so if I draw it early, we're happy because that level's higher and that tells me more. But if I wait 40 days after your relapse, that level is going to be a lot lower of that NFL. And then the, the, the image on your top right is actually looking at new damage on MRI. So this is looking at the bright spots, so the T2 lesions that we talk about. And you see those boxes stepwise increasing. So the more spots that somebody has on their MRI, the higher the level of NFL. And then the bottom one is looking at contrast enhancement. So that's the dye. So when you get a, a dye in your IV, uh, when you get your MRI, that also correlates. So it shows that, again, your NFL will be higher if you have new enhancing lesions. So this is pretty neat because we're saying we need better ways to monitor if MS is causing damage. And so if we have a blood test and we know your baseline and then we see that it goes up, that's a sign that you might be having new disease activity. And it goes up at the time of relapse, it goes up at the time that you get new lesions, and it goes up when you have contrast enhancing lesions. So that's really, really neat. So this is uh, another graph that basically is talking about what if we look at the time of CIS, so the first onset symptom of MS, how does that help us predict MS over time? This is just another way of showing it. I put an X over this, the picture on the right because that was the old criteria. It was called clinically definite MS, but we actually use this criteria called the McDonald criteria, and it was not Ronald, but it was a doctor named McDonald, and every couple years, that criteria has been updated, and the reason is because we want to diagnose MS earlier, we used to wait too long with the old criteria, and so people would have a lot of damage and potentially a lot of physical and cognitive problems before they would actually meet the diagnosis. But basically what this slide is showing you is that as those, if those levels are higher when you come in at the time of your first attack in the blood, the NFL, that we can predict that you have a significantly higher risk of going on to develop MS. So again, a blood test that could be very helpful. And this is another graph just describing a table explaining that a little bit better. And when we look again at the 2017 McDonald criteria, which is our current criteria for MS, it tells us that if you come in with really high levels, that you're anywhere between uh, you're about 1.6 times more likely than someone with low levels at the time of their attack to go on to develop MS. So that's incredibly helpful. Now, this is just another graph showing us based on how high someone's level is in that blood test. The orange line is somebody who's very high, so greater than 16, and then the blue line is the low, and then the pink line, if you can see it, is kind of in between. And again, it shows you that the higher your level is, the greater the risk of going on to develop MS after a first attack of multiple sclerosis. So can we use this to monitor for disease activity? Well, I've shown you some data that's pretty impressive, and I think that, yes, I think this will be helpful for that. So this is a, another study where they actually looked at people in MS clinical trials. So a long time ago, there was a study of a medication called fingolimod, uh, which is brand name Jelenia. And basically, they looked at what does that do on neurofilament. They actually did it as a side study separate from the trials that brought it to market. And so this slide is basically showing that in patients with MS, in the red, that again, their levels were higher at the start of the study than the blue, which would be people who don't have MS. This is a slide that shows that in those folks who had MS, if they had more spots on their brain MRI at baseline, that the more spots they had, the greater the NFL in their blood. And then again, showing you another, another study where if you have contrast enhancement on your MRI or those spots lighting up with dye, 
that those levels go up. So again, more evidence that this may help to monitor MS. So this is really cool. I'm really excited about this. So there's been a lot of um, newer studies looking at what happens to that level when you go on treatment. Because we talked about what is NFL. NFL is a sign that your neurons are being damaged. Okay, so we want to know when we go on a treatment that our neurons and our brain and our spinal cord are not being damaged, right? That's why we take it. We want to take it to prevent new damage. So if you look at the first picture on your left, both sides here, if you look at the first one, the blue line is the placebo group. So people who took nothing. Their levels of NFL, a sign of damage to their neurons, remained high throughout the study because they were taking nothing to protect them from damage in MS. The red line was that oral pill that I mentioned, fingolimod, and you see that that drops down essentially close to that of healthy controls. So that line, going on a treatment, dropped them to the level that you would expect in somebody that doesn't have MS. So that's pretty neat. I think that's really cool. The other picture that you see here is actually another study that was a clinical trial that actually compared, it was a one-year study, that fingolimod pill, so the oral um, MS drug once a day, versus interferon beta 1A. Both of them dropped the levels of NFL in the blood but if you look at the red line, that goes much lower and close to that of healthy controls. Where the folks that were on interferon, which again, when we compare interferon to our other drugs, tends to overall be less effective than the newer agents, that it dropped down, but it didn't drop down to that of healthy controls. So those folks still had signs of ongoing neuronal damage. It was better than not being on treatment, but not as good as being on a highly effective treatment. So this is a summer, summary slide that tells us a little bit about what, is, what does this really tell us? Well, if somebody has a really high level of NFL in their blood, they are about 2.6 times more likely to have new or larger bright lesions on their MRI. So that's helpful. If they have elevated levels, they're about two and a half times more likely to have an MS relapse and 2.9 times more brain volume loss. When they looked at disability, though, interestingly, in this study, it wasn't statistically significant. So I think we need more research on that, but I think it's helpful because if I could see my patients in clinic and they come in and we check a blood test over time and I say, wow, you were down here for a while and now for some reason today we're up here, I'm concerned. Let's check in, let's see what's going on. Maybe we need to change something. That could help to predict how you're doing with your MS. I'm going to skip that slide. So this, this image I know is very, very busy, but I want you to look at the graph on the, your far left. And if you look at that one, that's actually showing you again, based on levels of that NFL in the blood, it's helping us to know uh, if you're having more uh, GAD enhancing lesions. And basically they're saying again, if your level is higher, that you're more likely to have spots lighting up with contrast dye. This is another really busy image, but if you look at the top, that orange bar, it's telling us about folks who had consistently high levels of neurofilament. And then the middle bar is folks who had intermittently high levels and then folks who remain low throughout. And basically what this graph is showing you is that if you had consistently high levels, you were continuing to have more new spots throughout this four-year study. And you had greater shrinkage of your brain over four years. And so again, another helpful way to look at this as a potential marker of monitoring your MS. This is actually looking at other MRI outcomes, looking at five years and 10 years and brain atrophy. And basically the higher your blood level of NFL, uh, the, the greater the amount of bright new damage that we're seeing on your MRI. And again, more brain atrophy. So again, we want markers to know how you're doing on your treatment. And so if, if I have a blood test that I can look at that, maybe I could use that in place of an MRI down the road once we have better data. 
This is another neat slide. Uh, don't get overwhelmed by the busyness of it, but basically what it's showing you is what happens to neurofilament levels in a couple of other large clinical trials looking at MS-DMT. And so the blue image that you see here on your far left is basically showing folks who are in the placebo arm. And you see that their levels of that NFL, they just remain kind of crazy and high the whole time. But if you look at the orange, which is pegylated interferon, you see that they drop. Um, they dropped basically from about 25% you know, of folks being high to about 10%. And then if you look at the folks who were actually treated with, in the final image, uh, natalizumab, um, which is the once-monthly once infusion for MS compared to interferon beta-1A, those folks had a significant uh, drop and very few of them still had elevated levels. So again, I think a lot of good information to tell us uh, that this could be a really useful test to monitor how you're doing with your MS. So let's talk about primary progressive MS and neurofilament. Because PPMS, we often don't see as much change on the MRI over time as we do in relapsing remitting MS. And so this is one study that actually looked uh, at uh, specifically folks with primary progressive MS. And what they did was they, they had 50 individuals who have primary progressive MS, and then they had about uh, 50 folks who had ALS, so a completely different disease. And, and then they also looked at 50 uh, people who did not have a neurological disease. And when you look here, the, the light gray box, that's the that's the healthy folks, they're down lower in their levels of NFL in the blood. The middle blue box, those are folks with primary progressive MS. So again, levels in the blood are elevated, but then when we look at a neurological disease that's rapidly progressive, like ALS, they're much higher. So again, we have to know what disease we're looking at because we actually see them elevated in different neurological diseases where there's damage to the neurons in the brain and the spine. What they found, though, when they looked at spinal fluid levels of NFL in uh, folks who have primary progressive MS, they didn't really find that it correlated well with how they were doing physically. So we use a measure called EDSS to monitor how you're doing. So that's really just a neurologic exam that we put a fancy number to. And they found there was no correlation. So I think we need more studies specifically in the different phenotypes of MS to get better information. So I want to conclude this with telling you that I'm really excited about this. I think this is really interesting data, and I think we need better ways and more convenient ways to help all of you do well with your MS. We, you know, we find our current methods very effective, but no joke, it's expensive, and it's hard, and it's a lot of time for you to, to go in and do MRIs over time. I want to be very clear that it's not ready for prime time. We cannot replace MRIs yet at this point. I think that MRIs will always be part of monitoring, but I believe that over time, if we are able to define what normal values are, normal ranges for individuals with MS based on their age and based on the type of MS that you have, I think that this would be very helpful where potentially it would result in less frequent MRI monitoring. And so that to me is, you know, I would welcome that. And I just want to clarify that again, we see this in a number of neurological diseases. So again, we have to be very careful of knowing specifically the person that we're testing and why we're testing it. But I think that further research will certainly help with this. So um, thank you so much for your time today. And I look forward to your questions later on. Thank you. That was great, wasn't it? Good, I'm glad you all agree. Because next we have Karina Syracusa. By the way, before I introduce Karina, though, I want to thank all of our volunteers that helped out today. Thank you. I can name you all individually, but I didn't ask you first if I can name you, so it's a collaborative effort, all right? All right, Karina Syracusa. She's a doctor of physical therapy, board certified specialist in pelvic floor therapy. Guys, I'm sorry. But this is the conversation for right now, and I know we're just going to have to listen for a little while. She's international national speaker on the topic of neuropelvic floor treatment. 
she's the pelvic floor physical therapist for Ohio Health. She sits on the board of directors for the American Physical Therapy Association section on women's health. She continues education, she's the continuing education instructor on the topic of pelvic floor physical therapy. So let's welcome Karina Syracusa. Thank you very much. So um, we, today I'm going to talk about something that I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll be glad I'm talking about before lunch because we're going to talk about poop and pee today um, and why you should see a pelvic floor therapist when you have MS. Um, so who am I? Uh, as Stuart said, I am a pelvic floor physical therapist. What that means is that I am a board certified physical therapist, but then I mainly specialize in the area of pelvic floor. And uh, neuro has always been my passion. I actually started off as a pediatric PT before I got into pelvic PT. Uh, so there's a lot of correlations with what we do with just general pelvic floor PT um, and what happens when you have MS. Um, I am board certified, that is my specialty, so there, um, I am one of three board certified specialists in Columbus and the state of Ohio. Um, and I am also, as, a, as he said, an instructor for the American Physical Therapy Association, so I teach other pelvic floor therapists how to do this. So, what is pelvic floor physical therapy? Um, it's usually things that, you know, people always joke that it's that room in the clinic and they don't want to know what happens in that room um, because no one wants to talk about their downstairs area and polite conversation unless you're a pelvic floor physical therapist and then you have no problem talking about genitals in public. Um, <laughs> but um, we're primarily working with the muscles of our pelvic floor and I'm going to kind of show you guys what those are uh, and what that means. We work extensively on bowel and bladder habits. So almost everybody in this room, including those of us that don't have MS, probably have some pretty bad bowel and bladder habits. And those are just bad things that have happened over time that we've developed over time. We also work uh, on exercises with core stabilization. So we're really not just doing Kegel exercises. That's a huge misconception as far as what I do. If all I did was sit around and say squeeze and relax all day long, it would be a very boring job. Um, so we do a lot more than just Kegels. Um, and we also look at muscle relaxation of the abdominal wall and the pelvic floor. Oftentimes people will come in and they will not tell me that they have problems leaking they tell me that they have problems going. So either they go to sit down uh, on the toilet and they can't start the flow of urine, or it may be that they're constipated and they can't have a bowel movement. They sit there for 20 or 30 minutes trying to have a bowel movement. And that's often used, uh, due to the pelvic floor. All right, so what are those pelvic floor muscles? Um, these are the female pelvic floor muscles. You can tell the difference between a female and a male pelvic floor is females have three holes, men have two, okay? I'm always a little sad that I have to explain that, um, but I have to explain that to a lot of people. Women don't pee out of their vaginas, just that's your tip for the day. Um, so with that, it's, I've had to tell women that, so don't, don't laugh. Um, so other than those three holes, those, those pelvic floor muscles are the same, whether you are a man or a woman. Everybody should be doing Kegel exercises. We, as physical therapists, tell you we want you to walk, we want you to exercise, but if you're not doing your pelvic floor exercises, you're missing a huge and crucial piece of your muscular development. Um, and then you can see from the side that the pelvic floor muscles have this great supportive feature. They really sling from your pubic bone to your tailbone, and they hold everything in the pelvis up. So that's what that picture um, on the right hand side is showing that they hold for women, they hold up the bladder and the uterus and the rectum. And for men, it's the bladder, the prostate and the rectum. So there's a male pelvic floor. Again, you can see the only difference is, is that there's two holes instead of one. Um, but the men have that same supportive feature. We need those muscles to be able to hold everything up and to make sure that everything is functioning properly. If they don't, then that's where we get issues like pelvic organ prolapse. Or um, for men, sometimes that will result in things like prostatitis. So it's really important that these muscles stay nice and healthy. 
So what do the pelvic floor muscles do? Uh, we call it the four S's. So they are supportive, as I was just talking about. They hold up all of those pelvic organs. Uh, sphincteric, that is a fancy word meaning squeeze. So right now, unless any of you are actively urinating or defecating, and if you are, we have a problem, I would ask you to leave, um, your pelvic floor muscles are working. Okay, so your pelvic floor muscles are always maintaining a low level of contraction, and that's what keeps us continent. Sometimes when we have leakage, they're not working hard enough. So for instance, if you cough or you laugh or you sneeze and you leak a little bit, often that's because those pelvic floor muscles can't uh, take that extra load. Or if your pelvic floor muscles are too tight, what tends to happen is that you can't relax them. You can't urinate, you can't defecate, and that's a whole different set of problems. So that sphincter uh, portion of the muscle really has to work well in order for you to be able to have good bowel and bladder function. They are stabilizers. So you may have heard your physical therapist or your trainers or anybody on TV talking about the core muscles. You need to have a strong core. Well, your pelvic floor is part of your core. And if all you're doing is abdominal muscle exercises, you're missing a huge part of your core. Anytime you move, even if it's just to reach across the table to grab a fork, you are activating those pelvic floor muscles. Those muscles activate before any other muscle in the body. So they are a very important part of that core. And then sexual, the part that, you know, when I fix it, people bring me flowers and chocolates. And that's, uh, you cannot have an orgasm without good, strong pelvic floor muscles. So um, when people have something called anorgasmia, it's often due to weakness in the pelvic floor. So they are very important. Um, so again, this is what can happen, that bottom picture, when those pelvic floor muscles are not working in the supportive fashion that they're supposed to. Um, we get something called pelvic organ prolapse. Um, you may have heard the kind of colloquialism of, oh, my bladder's falling out. Well, that's not really true. Your bladder is not falling out of your body. What is happening is that it's pressing in on the muscular walls, and those are kind of prolapsing out. So that, um, when it gets very bad is surgical, uh, but it can be corrected in its early stages with pelvic floor physical therapy. Again, there's that sphincteric role. So um, the muscles uh, for both men and women, they surround the urethra and they maintain that low level of contraction and they pinch everything off. When you want to go to the bathroom, what happens is, is that those muscles relax and you're able to either urinate or defecate. So those muscles are really important in keeping us continent. This is my favorite muscle. This is the puborectalis, and it is part of those pelvic floor muscles. How many in this room have heard of the squatty potty? Has anybody heard? Okay, good. So the, the theory behind the squatty potty is when you see little kids pooping in their diapers, what do they do? They go and they squat, right? That's because instinctively small children understand that when I am in a squatted position, it's easier for me to poop, and that's all because of this muscle. So what you'll see from this picture is that that muscle, when it's contracted, is kind of cinching off the rectum. So it keeps us continent, it keeps us from having bowel accidents, but when we want to have a bowel movement, what that muscle does is it relaxes, it opens everything up. And so we need, that muscle, it relaxes most effectively when we're in a squatted position. So that's why the squatty potty works, because it allows you to still sit it on the toilet, but it, it kind of simulates that squat position. Um, and then stabilizers. So again, this is just showing um, the pelvic floor and its relationship to those core, uh, those abdominal core muscles. It's the floor of the core. So uh, I often use the um, imagery of a pop can or soda, depending on what part of the country you're from. Um, so uh, if you have a pop can and it's closed, you can squeeze it and liquid's not going to come out anywhere. But if you put a hole in that pop can and you squeeze it, liquid is going to come out of the hole because that's the path of least resistance. That's the weakness. So we need all pieces of that pop can to be nice and strong so that liquid doesn't come out. So we need those uh, abdominal muscles strong and we need, <clears throat> we need that pelvic floor strong. 
So we need everything to work in tandem. We need it to be strong. We need them to be able to contract quickly. And that's what happens when you cough or you sneeze or you laugh is they contract really, really quickly so that you can hold all of that urine in. They have to be able to relax in order to evacuate urine and stool. And in order for all of these things to happen, we should be working on them every single day. So uh, a lot of women after they have a baby are told to do Kegel exercises and they'll do them for a little while after they have a baby and then they kind of forget about them. Men are rarely ever told to do Kegel exercises unless they have prostate surgery. However, everybody should be doing these exercises every day. It's going to keep your pelvic floor strong and it's going to keep you healthy from a bowel and bladder standpoint. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the bladder. So the bladder in itself is a muscle. It's called the detrusor muscle. And this muscle has to also be able to contract and relax. What normally happens when you go to the bathroom is you sit down on the toilet or you stand. Your bladder contracts, your pelvic floor muscles open, you urinate, and then your pelvic floor muscles close and your bladder relaxes to allow it to fill again. So how many people in this room have experienced urgency or frequency, meaning when you got to go, you got to go, right? Okay. So that is often due to two things. One, it's the bladder contracting inappropriately. So your bladder is not full. So a lot of people will tell me like, oh, I have this feeling that I have to go to the bathroom or I'm going to leak. And then I get there and I pee out two or three drops. That's because the bladder wasn't full. The bladder shouldn't have been contracting. And that's what we have overactive bladder medications for. But the, those bladder medications like Mirbetric and um, Oxybutynin and Vesicare only work if it's truly the bladder that's the problem. If you're having that urgency and frequency because of bad habits, what we call just in case voiding, meaning going when you don't have to go, then what happens is, is that your bladder becomes progressively smaller and smaller and you have to go more often. So the bladder is a muscle and you still have to think about that kind of use it or lose it principle. Um, our bladder should fill to about 600 milliliters. So to give you an idea of what that looks like, if you've ever seen those small Fiji water bottles, the square ones, that's about 500 milliliters. Your bladder should hold at least that. Now, a lot of people, when I show them that, go, there is no way my bladder, or I, I've always had a small bladder. Listen, everybody's bladder is the same size. You were not born with a small bladder, okay? That is not a thing. Um, what has happened is that you have trained your bladder to contract before it is full. And so you need to make sure that you are allowing that bladder to fill appropriately. Now, the other thing that will cause that bladder to contract inappropriately is what we call bladder irritants. Those are things like my first love, coffee, um, but also pop, and that includes any kind of pop. Not people tell me, oh, I eat, you know, I drink decaffeinated pop, so it shouldn't bother me, or I drink Sprite. It's not the pop, it's the carbonation. So all of that can, can cause your bladder to contract uncontrollably. Tea will. Certain foods, things that are spicy, if it bothers your stomach, it's going to bother your bladder. So all of those things have to be taken in moderation in order to have a healthy bladder. And again, it's controlled by an on-off switch in the brain. So either you have to go or you don't have to go. Um, now, the bowel is a little bit harder to talk about because the bowel is very, very complex. There are so many things that affect the bowel, and you probably have all experienced this. If you've ever been nervous about something, sometimes you get diarrhea, or you know, you eat one little thing that's off, and all of a sudden your bowels have gone crazy. So it's much more than either it's full or it's empty. And so the bowel is a little bit more complicated and, and a little bit easier to kind of throw off course. Um, it's very, very easy to get constipated. If any of you have ever traveled and you get constipated just from traveling somewhere, you know that the bowel takes a, a lot more finesse in order to make sure that it stays healthy. Um, but as I said before, the relaxation of those muscles is the key in evacuation. 
So bladder habits. Let's talk about um, the what should be normal for a bladder. Peeing seven to ten times a day. So that's about every two hours. You can get up one time per night to go to the bathroom, and that's still considered normal. If you're over the age of 65, you get a second time. Congratulations. Um, and you're still considered in the normal range. Um, so AARP, and you get to go to the bathroom a second time a night. Um, but you're, um, you should be able to delay the urge to urinate. So if you have to pee, you should be able to wait a couple of minutes without feeling like you're going to lose the contents of your bladder. Um, again, two to three hours between voids. You should be able to initiate voiding uh, pretty quickly after sitting down. You shouldn't be straining to urge uh, or to, to urinate or defecate. And you shouldn't have pain with urination or defecation. So what are some bad bladder habits? Peeing the first time you get that urge. So a lot of people come to me and they say, well, I'm so afraid of leaking that the minute I get an urge, I need to go. Well, that's simply not true. We can train that bladder to not leak with, uh, with just a very little bit of urine in it. Um, squatting over the toilet. I know my mom was like, don't sit on a public toilet, it's dirty. Um, not true, okay? Or put some toilet paper down if you're really worried about it. What we do when we pee and squat is we're teaching our bladders and our pelvic floor to allow urine to pass through when it's contracted. So we're setting ourselves up for uh, incontinence. Straining to urinate, so that kind of like, I gotta go very quickly, so I'm gonna you know squeeze with all my might to get that urine out real fast, that's a bad habit. And then getting up multiple times at night. So one of the things I ask people is when they tell me, oh, I'm going four or five times a night, I ask them, is it the urge to pee that's waking you up or are you waking up and going, well, I'm up, I better go pee. Um, so that kind of, well, I'm up, I better go pee is a horrible habit to have because again, you're training that bladder to be a little bit smaller. Uh, typical bladder issues in MS, I don't need to tell most of you this, urgency, frequency, that inability to initiate flow, um, painful urination, and constipation, all of which can be helped by a pelvic floor therapist. Um, so again, with that urgency, that's just a bladder contraction that has kind of gone out of control. And so with that bladder contraction that has gone out of control, what we try to do is fill the bladder with healthy things, like have you drink more water. Most people, when I tell them you need to drink more to pee less, look at, look at me like I'm crazy. Um, but if we can cut down on the concentration of the urine in the bladder, you will urinate less. From a bowel habits, it's a little bit different. So bowel frequency is normal anywhere from three times a week to three times a day. So people will come and they'll tell me, oh, I'm constipated because I haven't gone in two days. That's not constipation. We worry more about the consistency of what your stool looks like than the frequency. So this is what's called the Bristol stool chart, um, and I'm going to ruin food for you forever. What we would like you to do is we want your stool to look like a Snickers bar, okay? So that's that type 3, or we want your stool to look like a sausage, which is type 4. What we don't want it to look like is type 1, which is like Whoppers, um, and we don't want it to look like type 7, which is peanut butter, okay? Um, again, you'll never look at those foods the same way again. Um, but we want, you, we want your stool to be healthy, firm enough that it's easily released, but not so firm that you're straining to get it out. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the foods that we eat and the things that we do throughout the day. So bad bowel habits include straining. So um, if you're popping a blood vessel in order to poop, that is not a good thing, OK? And that generally indicates that you are not relaxing those pelvic floor muscles. So it's very important that you're not straining that hard. Um, incomplete emptying. So the people that will tell me, oh, I get up and I feel like I have to poop again you know, five minutes later. Um, pain with bowel movements, so if it, if it hurts to have a bowel movement, there's generally a muscular problem involved. And then overly hard stools. Uh, the typical issues that I see in MS are constipation and then what we call obstructed defecation, meaning that um, something is keeping that fecal matter from flowing very well. So either it's a problem in the colon or it's a problem in the pelvic floor.
So what do I do for all of this? Um, so one, I am gonna, I warn people all the time, you are gonna take your pants off at some point in front of me, it's okay. Um, I do this all day, um, but it is the best way for me to understand what those muscles are doing is to by completing an internal evaluation. Um, I am completely qualified, as I said, I'm board certified, I didn't just wake up one day and said, I think I'm gonna have all my, my patients take their pants off. Um, so that is, I, I am a medical professional when it comes to that. Um, that's usually the first question I get. And number two is, why in the world would you want to do this all day? Um, so what we're doing from a pelvic floor therapy standpoint is we're taking a good history. We're doing a general postural assessment to see if any of those muscles are not working properly. Um, I'm going to do a mobility assessment. So is it the fact that you can't make it to the toilet on time that you're leaking all the time? Um, and then that internal pelvic floor assessment. I'm usually going to have you complete what's called a bladder diary. Um, and this is just where you're going to mark down how often are you going, um, what are you drinking throughout the day. Often we think we're going more than we actually are, so it's good just to get it down on paper. And if you see a urologist, they're going to have you do much the same thing. Um, and then I'll probably have you um, use the, the bowel diary, um, and you can see that it just asks you to kind of fill out when you're going to the bathroom and what you're storing looks like. So a couple of quick bowel and bladder tips for you guys to take home today. Um, one is drink water. So this does not include water with meals. This is just water on its own. Um, I tell people, you know, there's always that whole, you know, you need to eat or drink uh, eight to 10 glasses of water a day. I'm happy if you can drink 48 ounces of water, which is about, you know, four small bottles of water, um, at least um, uh, throughout the day without meals. Um, I want you to sip water throughout the day. So I don't want you to guzzle water because that's going to make you go to the bathroom uh, faster. I want you to practice urge suppression. So that means not going to the bathroom the first time you feel a little bit of an urge. Um, bladder timing. So sometimes what I'll have people do is kind of go at pre-programmed intervals, especially if they're having a lot of urgency. And then limiting fluids before bedtime. You should stop drinking all fluids unless you're taking medication right before bed about two hours before you go to sleep. So that, that your, uh, whatever water you're using to take your medication should be the only water you're drinking right before bed. From a bowel tip standpoint, not, we're not getting enough fiber. Most of us are not getting enough fiber. We want to see um, at least 30 grams of fiber a day. People will tell me all the time, well, oh, I, I eat wheat bread, and that's where I get my fiber. There is one gram of, of fiber in wheat bread. So unless you're eating the entire loaf a day, you're not getting enough fiber. Fiber comes from things like vegetables, which I know we're like, oh, I don't want to eat a vegetable. But um, it also comes from things like fruit. There are five grams of fiber in one apple. There is something to that old adage of an apple a day keeps the doctor away. So, you know, there are nine grams of fiber in one cup of raspberries. Um, so even if you have an extreme aversion to vegetables, uh, a lot of times what I'll talk to patients about is smoothies, because you can make smoothies with raspberries, apples, throw a little bit of kale in there. You won't taste the, the leafy green vegetable, but you're getting all of your fiber basically in that one smoothie. Um, I also would much rather people get their fiber from natural sub, uh, substances like foods than things like Metamucil. Um, proper stool timing and then toilet positioning. So again, I want to make sure that you're in that squatted position, but what this picture is showing you is I actually don't want you to do the tiptoe. So if you're like me and you're vertically challenged, you might not be able to reach the ground all the time when you're sitting on a toilet, and so you kind of put your toes up in that tiptoe position. That actually makes it harder for you to be able to relax those pelvic floor uh, muscles and go to the bathroom. Kegel exercises, everybody should be doing them every day. Um, you should be squeezing right now and I shouldn't be able to see that you're doing it. Um, you have to train for both endurance and speed. So you have to do quick kegels, meaning squeeze and relax 10 times. And then you have to do some slow kegels where you squeeze and you hold on for a little bit longer. Um, it also should be a squeeze and a lift. So again, as I said, you shouldn't, I shouldn't be able to tell you that you're doing a kegel by you lifting up off the chair, okay? So it should be thinking about trying to hold in gas and squeezing and lifting. Um, you also must be able to relax the muscle, so again, not strain.
So what can a pelvic floor therapist do for me? Um, we're gonna analyze that bladder diary for you, possibly do some exercises and core stabilization and a bowel and bladder behavioral program. So we're gonna do all kinds of exercises other than just kegels. We might do something called PNF, which is what I'm showing here. Um, but mainly the, the takeaway that I want you guys to have with this is that you need to have both that behavioral component of a bowel and bladder program as well as the exercise component. You can't just do one or the other and expect your bowel and bladder to be healthy. So again, we're gonna take questions at the end. Um, and actually, National Kegel Exercise Day is May 2nd, just so you know. So if you do them no other time, at least do them May 2nd. Thank you very much. All right, sorry about that. So again, thank you, Karina. Next, we have Dr. Jeffrey Eubank. And Dr. Eubank is the under, he's undergraduate from, and I'm gonna really mess up this name, all right? Muskingum College? Muskingum? Was that better? All right, Muskingum College, there we go. All right, he went to medical school at the university, the Ohio State University. He's neurology residency from Cleveland Clinic, and he's the chief resident from the Cleveland Clinic. Let's welcome Dr. Eubank. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a good talk. Thanks. Okay. Um, I thought it was hard to follow Dr. Boster before, and he is a hard act to follow, but Karina is a hard act to follow too. So she's going to make me amp up my game, I hope. So I learned a lot from uh, Karina. She actually gave a talk yesterday, and I only had to go to the restroom twice during her talk yesterday, and I thought that was okay. And since I listened to her, I said, you know what, maybe I should go see her, so. <laughs> Any event. So we're gonna talk about supplements and MS uh, today. And so first, I have a few disclosures there, you can see that. And next, the picture on the left is my uh, daughter and I in front of the Tower of London. We went to uh, London last week. And the picture on the right, uh, that is a certified dog tur who, uh, <laughs> who was covering for me while I was gone. And my patients actually got pretty good care, so I'm pretty impressed. So that is me having a pint at a proper English pub, and that's my daughter and I showing you how not to order two beers in England. If you order two beers, you do it this way. If you do it this way, it means a very similar to what would happen if you flip somebody the bird. So we did that in Ohio before we got to uh, Britain. So why am I talking about Britain? Well, we're going to start off by saying one of the things that uh, people call Brits in America, at least earlier this century, was limeys. Who, know what, who knows what limey means? What's it mean? Exactly. So that is our lead into uh, a little bit about vitamins. So Scurvy is a disease when you don't have enough of a certain substance called vitamin C, and it leads to joint pains, muscle pains, fatigue. If it goes on long enough, you start to hallucinate, you can have seizures, and you can die. In fact, this was such a significant problem for sailors uh, back in the 1600s, 1700s, that they were actually losing more sailors due to scurvy than they were in combat. So it was a really big issue. And in one of the very first clinical trials, there was a Royal Navy surgeon by the name of uh, James Lind, and he actually ran one of the first clinical trials. So he gave them hard cider and vinegar and had some people drink seawater and gave some people citrus fruits. And lo and behold, the ones that had citrus fruit didn't get scurvy, they did great. And so uh, we learned that citrus wins. Now why did it end up winning? It's because of the vitamin C in there. Vitamin C is one of those compounds that's super important for our bodies to function. We can't make it on our own. And when those things aren't there, the connective tissue, collagen, and things start to break down and other problems show up. So what are sup our vitamins? Vitamins, uh, we define them as they're organic molecules that occur in really small amounts, but 
if we do make them, we make only small amounts. So we have to generally get them from outside sources. Outside sources generally are in our diet, although sometimes, depending on the, the vitamin, it could come from sunlight and things like that. We'll talk a little bit about that. And if you don't have them, then you develop all sorts of uh, illnesses. We're going to also talk about a few other supplements, uh, some herbs and some nutraceutical type things as well today. So how many people raise your hand if you take supplements on a regular basis? Almost everybody, and that's pretty typical. So in this study, it was at least 68% of Mer uh, Americans regularly use supplements, and you see people that are really happy there because they're taking them for all these good and healthy reasons, right? It's, hey, I just want overall health to be better, or I want energy. Personally, I started taking uh, supplements, well, I, first when I was a kid because my mom had Flintstones and they tasted pretty good. But after that, I was in college, and I was like, eating Taco Bell, pizza, Taco Bell, pizza. I was like, well, I could either eat vegetables or maybe I'll just take a multivitamin and that'll substitute, won't it? Because I'll get all my nutrients that way. And then because you're staying up late, and then I said, well, caffeine's not enough. Maybe I should take a B vitamin because that gives me energy. And then I didn't want to get sick, so I took vitamin C. And then I have a family history of heart disease and a little dementia. And I heard, hey, maybe antioxidants are good. So I threw in a vitamin E, and then I threw in a fish oil. Interestingly enough, every time I added a supplement, I was like, Jesus, a lot of pills. And I actually didn't take any medication, but I had a bunch of these pills. And then they started falling off. Read, read some studies that multivitamins may not actually be all that helpful. And so I said, eh, maybe I'll stop it. And then I read a study where it said, oh, they may actually be harmful. And the same thing happened with vitamin E, and the same thing happened with fish oil and things like that. So I ended up not taking many supplements over time, just based on the evidence that's available. So what are the benefits of, of vitamins? Well, if you have a deficiency, like a sailor on the open seas and you don't have access to fruits, then that's a really good reason to take some sort of supplement. Um, vitamin C is a great example. Folic acid is super important, especially for pregnant women. If they're low on folic acid, there's a higher risk of birth defects. So now, generally, when women are pregnant, we recommend folic acid anyway, just to take away uh, as much chance as possible as birth defects. But Again, kind of what I was doing, sometimes people do it to make up for bad habits or bad diets, and really there's no better way to get the things that you need first and foremost through your diet. So vitamins aren't a substitute for the things we're supposed to be doing in the first place, no matter you know, whether we're gonna take supplements on top of that. Uh, one of those points there is that multivitamin, they actually did a study back um, about six years ago, and they took an older woman a population that were taking, they, some of them took multivitamins and the other group didn't. And actually the group that was taking multivitamins actually seemed to have a higher rate of mortality than the group that didn't. And they tried to compare, you know, control for everything else, and they couldn't really see a difference. So um, whether that means multivitamins are actually harmful or something else going on, but it certainly didn't look like it helped. Um, and so this is just from the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, uh, and this is one statement. Uh, it says, current evidence is insufficient to assess the balance of benefits and harms of the use of multivitamins for the prevention of cardiovascular disease or cancer. So a lot of us are doing it maybe for those reasons, but we don't have any great evidence that we should be adding that, at least based on studies we can look at. So why do MS patients take supplements? Um, a lot of you guys know your own reasons, but here are some of the reasons. We don't take care of everything, do we? We try to give medications to try and control the disease, but sometimes the disease keeps doing what it wants to do. There's still relapses that occur because we're not perfect there. There's still progression that it occurs. And more importantly, you know, very few if any of our medications so far look like they reverse the damage that occurs. We aren't remyelinating, we aren't regrowing nerve cells, and so the hope is, hey, maybe there's a supplement that sounds like it could do that. Um, incomplete disease control. Sometimes it's symptom management. It's like, hey, I have this symptom and it's not being kept under good control, maybe I could take this supplement to help out with that symptom. Um, and some people just kind of do it like, well, if my immune system's not doing well, I'll do something to enhance my immune system. Um, 
shortly after I showed up in practice, I remember one of my patients said, hey, I got all these herbs that I heard are going to boost my immune system. Now, there's debate whether those herbs were actually helpful in boosting the immune system based on evidence. But we actually talked about it. I said, if they actually did do what you said they're doing, that may not be the right thing for MS because we don't have an immune system that's underactive. We have one that's in some ways maybe an overdrive. So that's another thing that comes up sometimes. So let's look at the evidence for some of these uh, vitamins in just a minute here. One of the problems, though, with this, before we get into that, is how these things are regulated. Uh, when it comes to drugs that get approved, the FDA has very stringent criteria to show how well something works and what the safety is. And if they don't meet these strict safety and efficacy requirements, they don't get approved, and they get watched extremely close. And once they get released, if there's problems, we can identify them fairly well, not perfectly. When it comes to supplements, which are oftentimes used in the same way that we are using our drugs, we're using them to help help us, the FDA has a completely reverse opinion of them. They treat it pretty much like we do foods. And what does that mean? In terms of foods, the FDA is perfectly fine with the food. And unless somebody does something to show that it's harmful, they don't really have much of an opinion. So it's really the opposite. When supplements come out, nobody has to prove that they do what they do, and they don't have to prove that they're safe. They're just out there. So unless something egregious happens with a supplement or somebody learns something, those things remain available. And that's just the nature of how we do things. Officially, at least in this country, drugs aren't supposed to be, or supplements aren't out there to be advertised to treat or cure a disease. Now, by the time you actually look at the labels, it kind of looks like they are. So you have to be a little bit careful with that. Oftentimes, especially if you go on message boards or when people are saying, hey, you should do this, somebody's giving their own anecdotal response. Now, that's not a bad thing because we all look to, hey, what did my friend do and how are you feeling better? But the truth of the matter is that one person's anecdotal response is really not the high point of evidence. It's really just what that is, one person's response. Uh, so anecdotal uh, responses aren't the best way for us to understand how things work. Another thing is, is you don't always know what you're getting. Uh, there was a study done in Toronto a few years ago, and they actually took uh, a group, like 40 or 50 different herbs, and they looked to see if they actually had what they were supposed to have in them. And actually, only 42 per, or 48%, less than half of the herbs that were out there, actually contained what they said they did. They contain something else completely. And that's part of the problem. That's kind of the Wild West sometimes with these things. Um, and then lastly, sometimes, depending on the substance, they'll put other stuff in there that they don't tell you about. Now, that's really popular uh, when it comes to performance-enhancing supplements for weight lifters and things like that, but there's been other circumstances as well that they add other actual prescription drugs into their supplements to try to make them work a little bit better for people. So uh, that USP label, I just point out, is something that uh, looks at all the different supplements, and if that label gets slapped on them, it means they're probably at least putting in what they say they are and not adding other things. So you want to be careful if you are going to take a supplement and maybe look for that label. So we're going to talk about first vitamin A. Vitamin A is uh, uh, in there. It's important for eye health and things like that. When it comes to MS, somebody did a study, and they looked at a guinea pig model of uh, MS called allergic, or we'll, we'll just call it EAE just for the sake of ease. But basically, what they showed was that there was improved motor function in these guinea pigs. So they said, hey, let's do a trial on humans. and when they gave 25,000 units of vitamin A to 39 patients, they measured certain inflammatory markers. Now, in the setting of MS, we want those inflammatory markers to be lower, meaning less inflammatory, and that's presumably a good thing. And what they found was, hey, we have less of these inflammatory markers. So they said, hey, let's do another trial looking at MS patients. They did larger number, 101 patients. And what they found was that was, well, at least it seems like they had reduced fatigue and depression. What they weren't able to demonstrate was whether it reduced relapses or disability or MRI activity, but at least showed some positivity. Um, the caveat to that is you have to be careful with vitamin A. If you get 
too much, uh, especially for pregnant women, that's not a good thing, can cause birth defects. But you get too much, you can also cause other problems, headaches and other conditions. So right now, vitamin A, there's a possibility that there's some benefit and again, requires more study. Now, requires more study is what you're gonna hear about just about everything that I'm gonna say because we don't have anything that for sure helps, but we're gonna be saying that a lot. Vitamin C, they looked at it in one of those animal models. It didn't work. There's really no trials out there that, that one way or the other for MS. For a while, some people were touting it as being a, a treatment for urinary tract infections, and it turns out it really doesn't help that either. What about vitamin E? Uh, one of the animal models, it looked like it actually was beneficial, uh, but to date, Nobody's done a study on MS patients to see if it could be beneficial or not. Uh, and remember, one of my earlier comments was uh, I started taking vitamin E because I thought it might be helpful for other issues. And it turns out that if you took 400 units of vitamin E a day, it looked like you died a little bit more often than people that didn't take any at all. So whatever that's worth. What about the B vitamins? Uh, I put this up here so I could be friends with Karina because I have a toilet there. And in that toilet is yellow P, and the yellow P is because if you take B vitamins, specifically the riboflavin, it makes your P turn really bright yellow there. Um, there's a couple of vitamins there that weren't shown to have benefit in an animal model or MS. In riboflavin, they did do a study uh, in that uh, the animal model showed that it might be beneficial. They did a really small study in 29 MS patients and they didn't see any benefit. So whether a bigger study would show that or not, hard to know. What about B12? B12 is important to talk about because B12 is one of those things that it's not that uncommon for people to be deficient in it and it can actually either mimic symptoms of MS, or if you have MS, it could maybe make some of those other symptoms worse. What does low levels of B12 do? It can cause numbness and tingly. It can cause imbalance. It can cause gait problems. It can cause thinking problems. Even can cause dementia in some people. So a lot of the things that people with MS might be susceptible to, low levels of B12 can either contribute or mimic. Um, so it's important, and when you see uh, your physician, oftentimes that's going to be checked early on to make sure that's not playing a role. Uh, a lot of times patients are asking, hey, I heard a friend, they got a B12 shot, it gave them a bunch of energy. Um, and we used to, if somebody had a very low level of B12, we used to just give a shot and that was the only way we treated it. Still very effective. Why would we give a shot? Mostly because a lot of the people who are deficient in vitamin B12, it's not really a nutrition issue, it's an absorption issue. Uh, but they did study it and it turns out that if you take a high enough dose by pill, you can actually overcome that absorption issue and get your levels up just as good. So nothing wrong with the shot, but you can probably do a similar type thing doing a supplement uh, with an oral replacement. They did study it specifically in an animal model, showed that it might be helpful, and there haven't been any specific direct uh, B12 MS studies to know whether that's helpful or not. What about biotin? Biotin's another B vitamin. It also goes by the name B7. Um, this one's actually kind of interesting. Um, it helps in uh, with our body with energy metabolism, and specifically, it's been wondered whether it might be helpful with damaged neurons or with remyelination. So the typical recommended dose is about 0 0.03 milligrams per day. A French company decided, hey, let's do 10,000 times that dose. I don't know how they came up with 10,000. I'm sure there was some science behind it. So 300 milligrams a day, this is what they've been studying. And the interesting thing is, is they at least found some potential positive results. So they studied some people looking just at their uh, optic nerve function. And in a small study of 23 patients, they demonstrated, huh, their visual acuity seemed to get a little bit better, and one of the tests for that that we used to see if the optic nerve is healthy got a little bit better. Huh, that's interesting. Let's look more. They did another study where they looked at uh, roughly 74 patients, and they were hoping to improve uh, the outcomes, and they weren't able to demonstrate the primary outcome that it was beneficial, but some of the sub-studies 
did look like they could be positive. And they had some MRI markers that suggested it might be doing something helpful as well. Um, the caveat was they thought, huh, we're seeing a few more relapses in this group, so what's that all about? So right now there's another study with a larger amount of patients, about 642 progressive patients with MS, and that studies the results are due to come out in a, roughly a year from now. Um, so it's pretty exciting stuff because we have one approved therapy for progressive MS, and this is another therapy that's being looked at, so we're hopeful uh, that this may prove to be beneficial. One caveat, though, when you take high doses of biotin, it can interfere with other lab tests. Why might that be important? Some of those lab tests impact thyroid function, test whether you po test positive for certain viruses and things like that. So there's actually been a number of circumstances where people have had blood tests that people couldn't understand, and it was turned out that the high doses of biotin gets in the way of how that blood test works, so it can confuse the physicians or the lab, so uh, we always tell our patients to be aware of that um, if they're taking that. And it's, it's really hard to figure out. You have to kind of go to each lab and ask them, how do you run your lab test and could it be influenced by biotin? So it's kind of confusing. Next one that's also, we talk about this a lot in our clinics, and it's vitamin D. Vitamin D is a hormone that most people are aware of is beneficial for bone health. Um, very important for that, but it's also important for how our neuro, uh, neuromuscular system functions, and it also impacts our immune system. Uh, most people that study MS were aware for a long time that MS seems to be more common in certain regions of the world. Uh, so if you live in the farther north you get of the equator, it seems like you have a higher risk. And some people started looking at that and they say, huh. Well, the farther away you are from the equator, the less sunlight exposure you have. And we know sunlight is very important to convert in our skin something into vitamin D that we can use. So somebody says, huh, I wonder if the reason people have more MS in, say, Columbus, Ohio, rather than Mexico City, could be sunlight exposure and ultimately vitamin D. So they did a study and they looked at nurses and in the nurse study of 200,000 women, and this is not the only thing that they were looking at, but they found that this fell out, the women that were taking a dose of vitamin D seemed to have a lower incidence of uh, MS. There was a military study where they actually measured the levels of vitamin D and it looked like the higher level of vitamin D that they had, the less risk of MS. So it gave us a pretty good idea that, uh, that vitamin D at least plays a role in developing MS in the first place. Also for those people that had MS, when their vitamin D levels were low, they tended to have more relapses and more progression. So another thing that says, huh, it might matter when people have MS, what their vitamin D levels are. So the last question is, can we do anything about that? Can we provide supplementation to patients to improve their function with their disease just by taking a supplement? Right now, the jury's still out. There were some small studies early on, roughly five of them, that showed a benefit maybe in relapses, maybe in disability, maybe even some MRI measures. So they said, hey, let's do larger studies. So far, those larger studies have failed to show a benefit, uh, but we still think there could be something there. So there's ongoing trials trying to look at this very s subject to say, hey, are we supposed to be taking X amount of vitamin D or making sure the levels get to a certain point to help improve disease function? We're just not sure yet. One thing that is true, though, is patients with MS, uh, you guys, potentially have a risk of uh, having poor bone health because you may not have the same mobility, may not have the same uh, exposure to vitamin D, things of that nature, get steroids, they all help impair bone health. And we do know that vitamin D is really important for bone health. So I know in our clinic, we pay attention to vitamin D levels because we don't want them to go low if no other reason for bone health and then potentially uh, for how MS goes. I'm going to skip minerals because basically taking minerals didn't seem to help much. A few herbs, ginkgo biloba gets taken sometimes to help with thinking and cognition. Um, turns out when it was studied for MS, it didn't look like it helped that. Um, there was some possibility that it helped fatigue a little bit. It was unclear. There's a little bit of risk that if you take that drug though, you could have bleeding problems, especially if you're on other kind of blood thinners. So you have to be careful with that. 
I mentioned before about echinacea. That's a drug that's felt to possibly boost the immune system. I'm not sure if it actually does, but if it did do that, that might not be helpful for MS. But there's no studies one way or another whether it's helpful or harmful. St. John's wort, I point out there that uh, depression is not uncommon uh, when it comes to MS. Um, and some people take St. John's wort on their own. You definitely, if you are going to do that, let your physician know because it can interfere with other drugs we might use to treat depression. In fact, it can inter interfere with other drugs as well. So that's something that sometimes gets used. And then I point out cranberry sometimes gets used. And there was some studies suggesting that it could be useful in helping prevent UTIs, especially in people that were uh, susceptible to that. Um, but if you have a urinary tract infection, it's not going to get rid of it. Uh, there's a drug called levocarnitine. It's an amino acid. It helps with energy metabolism, and it's been studied for fatigue in MS. It was compared to another drug that we use for fatigue called amantadine. Actually looked like it outperformed it on a couple measures. Larger studies didn't show that benefit. Uh, currently, there's a study in France going on right now to see if there actually is a benefit in improving fatigue. Here's another one that might impact uh, how the disease progresses. It's called alpha lipoic acid. It's ultimately an antioxidant. And they showed in a human study that it did reduce those inflammatory markers a little bit. And then when they did it uh, in, to see if it actually improved clinical functioning and things like that, they weren't able to meet their primary benefits, but there was some suggestion it could be beneficial. So there's some interest in looking further at that potentially to see if that could be be something that would be useful in how the disease progresses. Turmeric, I'll just say it worked in an animal model. And then lastly is frankincense. It's one of the essential oils that uh, has been out there. Uh, there's a group actually out of Germany a few years ago that was able to demonstrate in 28 patients some benefits on some MRI measures. So they're currently looking at possibly doing a further trial to see if that would be beneficial. So there's a lot of uh, studies being out there to see if we can identify something that would be helpful. And we know these things are out there. And Sometimes you can take them without a prescription, but you definitely want to have that conversation with your uh, provider before you do that. And at that, I think I have, oh, I'm nine seconds over.